get back on track. If you put all the IMF and World Bank and OECD and independent bankers' opinions, you basically get the following to-do list. Work harder, be more efficient, increase education, be more technologically advanced, and indebt your country so that you can boost the um, GDP growth. In other words, be like Japan. The irony, of course, of the whole story is that Japan has not been growing for the past three decades. What's my point? My point is, even if, and this is impossible for us Europeans because we like life, even if we would be as hardworking as Japanese, even if we would be as work devoted as Japanese living in a small little cubicle and spending 98% of my free wake time uh, at work and being quite ready to commit suicide if you, if you lose your job, having two weeks of holidays, if you're lucky, which means running around Europe and taking pictures of you with various backgrounds, and this is a, the hobby. Uh, even if we would be as high-tech as uh, Tokyo and, and other Japanese cities, even if we studied as hard as Japanese students study, which is three times harder than anybody I've seen in Europe, even if we indebted 200% of our GDP in order to boost growth, even then the economy would not grow. Now, why is this? There are many explanations. The one that I want to focus on is the sort of golden ceiling, golden ceiling explanation. And one of the explanation is Japan cannot grow because they've already hit the golden ceiling, so to speak. Everybody has two iPods and two cars. You really don't need a third one, even if it's for free. So how to, you know, how to grow if people are actually happy? Now, that's just one of the explanations, and I'm not focusing on the explanation. What interests me to the barest degree is why, oh Lord, do we take this as bad news? Because this should be, ladies and gentlemen, this should be a hallelujah moment. You know, we're done. Everybody already has everything. You don't have to work so hard. Maybe you can take three days holiday instead of one and enjoy a little bit more uh, of this small little thing called life. But no, we take it as a catastrophe. And that's exactly going back to the example with the milk. We don't care how much milk we have. The only thing we care about the new one. You can perfectly see this in GDP. GDP only measures new production, the new milking. GDP does not care about how rich that country uh, actually is about how much milk we actually have. We don't even have it counted. There is really no statistic to, to measure how rich Poland actually is. You know, all the, all the summer houses and the ships and, and the, we, don't, we, we don't know. We really don't give a care about the milk that we've already milked the cow. So how to read this? Again, uh, one possibility is that I'm repeating myself that capitalism has already given us almost everything that it could. And there is really no more treasures that we can find in this forest called economic growth. And we, it's about time, like Keynes predicted 80 years ago, to, for economics to be placed where it belongs. This is Keynes uh, in his speech grand possibilities of our, uh, sorry, economic possibilities of our grandchildren. He says, when we will be rich, he estimated that about 100 years from now, this I think will be in two, three years, exactly 100 years from this speech, we will put economics where it belongs. In other words, it will be a, a maintenance like, like a plumber. Oh yeah, in Poland I, I can talk about plumbers, no? Coming from, coming from Czech Republic, so that's good. Uh, so that's what economy should be. It should, the building is built. We no longer need priests, economists, to tell us what to do and work our days in and out. The architecture is fine. The architect can go home. And the only thing we need is fractures and leakages in, 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 in plumbing and uh, etc. So it is not, ladies and gentlemen, I claim, it is not a crisis of capitalism, per se. 
it is a crisis of growth capitalism. That's a little bit different philosophy or, uh, or even perhaps religion. Now, what is growth capitalism? The most ironic thing about growth capitalism is that growth capitalism doesn't actually have much to do with growth. Uh, the growth that growth capitalism most enjoys and most produces is an artificial growth created by state debt. So we live in a society where the, where the economy or the society is rich and affluent, but the middle, the political, the common is not poor, it's indebted, it's worse than poor. So the economy is rich, there is surpluses of everywhere. The only thing you can never almost find is a surplus of budget. How this functions, the basic operational modus vivendi of this religion or ideology of growth capitalism is the following. If I go to a bank and I take a loan of 100,000 euros, only a complete fool would say that I am 100 euros richer. Everybody understands the difference between owning money and owing money. It's a small little, in English, small little difference, but actually makes a hell of a, hell of a difference if you own money or if you, if, you, if you don't own money. So there it is clear. You actually, you're actually a little bit poorer if you do the, this is what we learned in school, the dis, you know, discontinuity, uh, discounting it, the time value of money. Fine. Now, please tell me, why, oh why, when the government does almost exactly the same thing, in other words, the government borrows 3% of GDP, invests it into the economy because the economy needs help. That's uh, psychoanalysis. I sometimes get bored by, by these panels that are called how to, how to help the economy, so I do a psychoanalysis of that debate immediately. So the first note is here is obviously the economy needs help which is not something that we like to believe. We believers in you know, the free market and the economy being the prime over, over everything else, the rational, self-allocating, self-directing, invisible hand of the market that guarantees market rationality. But never mind. The government takes a loan of 3% of GDP, invests it into the economy because the economy needs help, and next year, the economy, say, grows by, for example, 3% of the same GDP. Everybody, including Yale, MIT, Harvard-educated economists, go around the town dancing and clapping, nice try, and screaming, we are, hallelujah, we are 3% of GDP richer. Not. I don't have to be provocative in everything that I say, so I have, I have, a, I have a sort of a, uh, a suggestion. Let's keep the abbreviation GDP because it's been so much used and we are quite uh, attached to it. But it shouldn't stand, I don't know how this will translate into Polish, it shouldn't stand for gross domestic product, but it should stand for gross debt product. And in that case, yes, we have grown by 3% of gross debt product. Uh, by the end of, um, by, I think, how much more time do I have? Do I have a time, time count? No, then throw something at me if I speak for, oh, okay, no, in that case, I, I'd be shorter. <laughs> okay, my last, my last food for thought, if I may, again, trying to take the reverse, reverse approach that, that I hear all the time. Um, is, I don't know if you've seen the, uh, the French movie Le Grand Bouffe. In Czech, it's Velka Žranice. I don't know if that makes any sense in Polish. Yes? People indulging. The, the, it's a very disturbing, it's a French movie, so it has to be disturbing. Um, people indulge in, 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 in gluttony and they eat till they die. How is it called? Yes, yes. Jako žranice. Tak, velká žranice. So, uh, <laughs> funny the words we have in common, right? <laughs> so, uh, so the point of the movie is um, um, there is enough supply of food, but there isn't enough demand of food. You know that in economics everything is about demand and supply. Now you will remember, uh, as well as I, 
that during the communist time or the socialist time, we also had crises in this region and this part of the world. But those crises were altogether different. We wanted sugar, but there was no sugar. We wanted cars. In Czech Republic, old cars were cheaper, no, sorry, were more expensive than new cars. Was it like this here too? Okay, because the new cars were simply, you had to wait for two years for those who are younger ones here, just to, just to explain. So there was enough of cars, uh, sorry, uh, we wanted cars, the demand was sound, but the supply, supply side, the supply chain kept uh, faltering. Uh, we wanted razor blades, as you can see, um, but there were no razor blades. It was a shortage economy. So the demand, the hunger was there. Um, my father, can, can I tell a joke? My father uh, uh, had friends from Finland, and once during the communist regime in the eight, late 80s, he came for visit, and we were walking down Wenceslav Square in the middle of Prague, and there was this huge queue stretching hundreds of meters, and this Finnish person asks my father, sorry, what is this, what is this queue for? And my father says, I think it's probably bananas. And uh, you know how Finnish people don't talk very much, so this also didn't say much, and after five minutes he, of walking down, he looked at my father and said, you know, with a queue like that, I'd rather buy them. So that's how a crisis looks when the hunger is present, but demand is malfunctioning. Now, fast forward 25 plus years to today, finding ourselves also in some sort of an economic crisis, but this time the crisis is altogether different. The supply